everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jean and I have a background in classical mythology, particularly pertaining to the ancient Greeks. That is where my area of study lies. I am very close <laughs> to finishing my PhD on the subject and I also run an ancient history podcast called That's Ancient History. So today I wanted to film a video that I've been asked to film for years now. I filmed variations on this theme, but nothing ever quite so in-depth or specifically targeted at anyone interested in getting into Greek literature and where to start. Obviously you can tell from the title, we are here to talk about ancient Greek literature specifically and how to get into it, where to start with the various genres, what you might want to pick up to learn about the myths and just generally how to access that subject area. This isn't true of all countries, but in the UK in particular there is a lot of classism tied up in the traditional study of classics and ancient history as a subject. As somebody who comes from a state educated background, a working class background where this topic was never explored in my formal education prior to university, it is therefore something I'm very passionate about creating access to it and making sure that everybody has access to it. Because as I can vouch, this is a fascinating area of study and it is not one that belongs to any one class, particularly the upper classes as it has been historically. And I therefore want to be part of an ongoing movement to break down those barriers, to break down those boundaries and to remove some of the pomp and pretense around the subject. So, if you're interested, stick around and I will share with you some of my tips and recommendations for starting off with ancient Greek literature. So I want to start with the topic of epic poetry. So epic poetry is probably one of the most famous and popular genres of writing from ancient Greece. It was something that garnered a lot of respect from the ancient Greeks and it is probably the oldest genre in that prior to it ever being written down, it was the way that they orally transmitted stories through generations and two of the books that are the most famous from ancient Greece and therefore some of the most important to read if you're getting into the subject because they're referenced throughout both ancient literature and modern literature are the Odyssey and Iliad by Homer. So these are pieces of archaic Greek literature, both of which are epic poems, dealing with events surrounding the Trojan Wars. So chronologically, it's the Iliad that comes first in terms of events. This specifically follows the soldier Achilles and his rage and his emotional turmoil during a short period in the Trojan War. So it doesn't cover the whole sort of decade that is the war. It doesn't cover the infamous Trojan horse it is very much honing in on Achilles' emotions and experiences in some of the final days of the war. And as much as this is obviously a very important piece of literature and beloved by many, I personally feel that the Odyssey is one that is much more accessible to new readers of ancient literature. Whereas this obviously takes place over a few days, very much honing in on emotion and events surrounding a war, this one is an adventure story. It's the journey of the hero Odysseus following the Trojan War as he attempts to get back home but is waylaid by a myriad of different mythical beasts and gods and creatures that get in his way. And not only do we get Odysseus's perspective, we also hear from his son and wife who are still at home waiting for him, wondering if Odysseus himself is even alive. And in this book you will encounter so many famous names and events and get a really good overview of one of the most heavily referenced pieces of Greek mythology. If you're a fan of Circe by Madeline Miller, this is probably probably your first port of call for reading more and I would really really highly recommend this which is one of the more recent translations to come out in English by Emily Wilson. It is a verse translation as is this translation of the Iliad which would also be my first recommendation by Richmond Lattimore and I completely understand that verse may be a little bit intimidating. It does stay a little bit truer to the original text because it retains that style of writing. However, if you are really put off by the idea of reading something in verse, which I completely understand, then it might be worth checking out Evie Rue's translation of the Odyssey, which was actually my first experience of this text. And it makes for very accessible reading. So those are obviously the first two I had to mention. But another piece of archaic Greek epic poetry that you might want to check out is the works of Hesiod. So this is a bind up of Hesiod's Theogony and Works and Days, which are two 
shorter epic poems, they might be better described as uh, didactic poems, particularly the works in days, that explore the origins of human life on Earth. These poems take you back through the family tree of some of the most important, most well-known Greek gods, so it gives you a really good introduction to the topic of Greek mythology and also the creation of humanity through Pandora and Prometheus and all of the myths tied up in human life. Now with any piece of ancient Greek literature there are a lot of layers to dig deep into but that is what this book is on the surface and I think because of that it makes for very easy reading. It's also very short and this is the Oxford World Classics edition which is the one that I always go back to. Now I realise I primarily recommended verse translations of of Homer but my next epic poem I'm actually recommending a prose translation because I just think it's so readable and this video is all about accessibility and getting into the topic. So this is Jason and the Golden Fleece by Apollonius of Rhodes. Again it's a little bit shorter than Homer's epic poems and this one dates from quite a few centuries later from the Hellenistic period. Now personally this is my favourite piece of epic literature but that's going to vary depending on what kind of reader you are. I love this book and I love the story and I love the mythology it deals with. It is the story of the hero Jason and his crew of Argonauts who sail across the seas in order to get the golden fleece from the king of Colchis and it's also when Jason meets the princess Medea and about their romance and how she helps him and his crew. If you're interested in learning more about epic poetry as a genre it's really interesting to compare to Homer's work because it's actually quite different in tone and style and it very much plays on political themes and themes in literature that were important to people in Apollonius of Rhodes's times. However, regardless of all of that it is just a very compelling narrative and you don't need to do a super deep dive into the genre and the history of epic poetry to enjoy it and I think that is first and foremost what I want to get across in this video. Of course epic poetry is not the only kind of poetry to come out of ancient Greece so I wanted to mention two more recommendations here. Another of which is attributed in many editions to Homer and these are the Homeric hymns although the consensus is that these were written by a array of various other authors and we just you know call them the Homeric hymns. I know that's very confusing um, and you will come across that on a few occasions in ancient Greek literature where things are attributed to authors that no one actually believes wrote them <laughs> and this is one of them. However this is essentially a collection of really important myths in hymn or poem format. So you will come across some of the original versions of the Demeter, Hades and Persephone myth in here and some veer more towards storytelling than others. Some of them are just more breakdowns of the gods themselves. So if you're interested in Greek mythology and who the main pantheon of Greek gods are then this is a great place to go and aside from the fact that it's written in a poetic style it effectively reads like a short story collection. Now a name you might be familiar with even if you never read her is Sappho because Sappho's name has essentially become synonymous with sapphic love and women loving each other whether they are bisexual, pansexual, lesbian, what have you. Sappho is effectively an icon in the LGBTQ plus community because she is an example of an ancient woman who loved other women and these are her poems. Now Sappho's poems may generally feel more familiar to modern poet readers because they're not in that epic style, they're shorter, although a lot of them aren't in full. Some of them have only survived in pieces and you're only actually reading pieces of them. But even those pieces, even those poems that only have two lines surviving are so beautiful that this book is so well worth reading. I think any poetry lover of any era could get something from this collection. There is lots on the themes of love and family and it is just also really wonderful to be able to read something written by a woman from antiquity because that is so rare and Sappho is really the only ancient Greek woman whose work survives in any substantial form so yes. So aside from poetry one of the most popular forms of ancient Greek literature that ancient Greeks would have experienced was that performed on the stage and that is to say that a lot of these would not have been read by ancient people, by ancient Greeks, they would have been seen but today you can obviously read them or go and see them on occasion because they are often performed in new and exciting ways which is super cool. But it was a very important part of ancient Greek life so it's a very important part of an introduction to ancient Greek literature. Particularly in Athens where most of these tragedies 
and comedies come from. These were part of religious festivals. Tragedies and comedies were performed as part of religious celebrations and religious festivals. And what is really interesting is that most ancient Greek tragic plays would have been written and performed in trilogies. So three plays one after another that told the story of a whole myth and almost all of the ancient Greek tragedies that were written and performed were about ancient Greek mythology. The only ancient Greek trilogy to survive in full however is Aeschylus's Oresteia. So no other ancient Greek tragedy has come down to us with its companions. This is the only one where we have the entire story arc as it would have been performed in all three plays. So I do think this one is probably one of the best to start with in terms of getting to grips with the genre of ancient Greek tragedy. It doesn't feel so much like a vignette within a larger story, it feels like a whole story if you read them all back to back. The three plays in this book explore the three plays in this book tell the story of Agamemnon, Clytonestra, and Orestes, their son, the murder, the revenge, and all of the drama intertwined in their lives. But there were two more very significant names in ancient Greek tragedy from classical Athens who were Sophocles and Euripides, so I had to include a little bit of them in this video. Some of the most popular plays by Sophocles are his three Theban plays, so these are usually collected together, but they are not from a complete trilogy. They all deal with the same myth, which I know is a little bit misleading, and they can be read consecutively to get a good idea of the myth as a whole, but these were not performed together, they were written separately, just to be clear, and those are Antigone, Oedipus the King, and Oedipus at Clonus, although the order that they are in this, this collection is slightly odd. Oedipus the King really should be read first if you're going to read them chronologically and it's just another really great insight into some really famous Greek mythology. Then lastly I wanted to mention this collection of Euripides plays from Oxford World Classics which collects together Medea, Hippolytus, Electra and Helen. So each play in this collection again would have come from a separate trilogy but deals with the myth of one specific ancient Greek women and Medea is probably his most famous. Now I do want to provide a caveat to anyone going into Medea because I know it's a really popular entry point into ancient Greek tragedy and I understand why. It's a really compelling play, there's a lot of emotion in there, it's really fascinating but it is Euripides version of this myth. So the thing about ancient Greek myths is each one has numerous different versions and it's not uncommon to find versions of the myths that we don't find anywhere else before the tragedians in a tragic play. That's not to say that they made them up off the top of their head, but that's also to say that these are not the only versions. So famously in Medea, Medea kills her own children and she gets this reputation as the mother murderess, but I always like to point out that this is not the most popular version of that myth until Euripides comes along. More often than not, Medea does not kill her children and she deserves both sides of her story to be known. However, despite the popularity of tragedy, it didn't seem fair not to include some comedy because one of the things I love about ancient Greek comedy Aristophanes in particular, is how recognisable some of this humour is. You will find in Aristophanes straight up fart jokes that just demonstrate the way in which some things just never seem to go out of style and it also breaks down I think some of that pretense and that pomp that surrounds ancient Greek literature. It gets this reputation for being quite intimidating and high and mighty but honestly half of it's fart jokes. So I would definitely suggest checking out a little bit of Aristophanes if you want a little bit of insight into ancient Greek humour. This is a collection that binds together birds, Lysistrata, the assembly of and wealth. There are various different plays by Aristophanes out there but I think again Lysistrata is probably one of his most famous and most popular so it's a really great entry point and you might recognise it in some more modern retellings that play on that myth and its themes. I then have three works of prose none of which are like the other. So each of the books I hold here are very different from each other, but each one was written in prose. The first one is the earliest one in this pile, and that is Plato's Symposium. So I had to include a little bit of philosophy in here. I did opt not to include historical writing in this video, just to, you know, keep some sort of focus and not to overwhelm you. I also think that's kind of like a whole other topic of discussion that you could go really in depth with. So as you've already seen, most of the books in this video deal with myth and that is very common of ancient Greek literature. A lot of their literature dealt with their 
myths. And that is also true of Plato's Symposium. This is a philosophical work. It is told in the style of a group of friends who have congregated together at a symposium, which is in effect a kind of drinking party that men would have attended together. And they are all sitting around the symposium telling their versions of love and what love is, especially in terms of the god Eros, who he is and what influence he has on society and each has a very different theory. So when you're reading this you're getting lots of little different philosophical ideas of what love is and it references a variety of different myths. I think it's a really really interesting little book and a really great introduction to Plato. There's a lot more Plato to read. He remains one of the most famous philosophers of all time, not only from ancient Greece, and some of his work is quite dense and it's a little bit intimidating and that is fair to say, but this one I think is perfect because it's a little bit shorter, it's a little bit fun, and unlike some of his more political writings, you don't need to have as great an understanding of ancient Greek society itself to jump into this work. We then have two works which actually date to the Roman Empire. So everything else I've shown you in this video so far dates to the BCE years, aka before the Christian era, whereas these two books date to the CE years, which we're currently in, or the AD years as some of you might know them. <laughs> but neither of them are Roman literature because this is a video all about Greek literature. If you would like a video introducing you to Latin and Roman literature, however, do let me know. And they are both quite different. This one right here is my favourite piece of ancient Greek literature for so many reasons. This is Longus's Daphnis and Chloe, and if you've seen me talk about ancient literature before, you've probably seen me mention this because, like I said, it's my favourite and I take any opportunity to talk about it or recommend it. And I love it, like I said, for many reasons. I love it for the layers. It's part in the history of ancient Greek literature as this is a prose novel or prose fiction story that's an entire creation by the author as opposed to being a version of a myth and that's a type of ancient Greek literature that didn't become popularised until the Hellenistic era and we only have five ancient Greek novels surviving at all, all of which I've read. I actually did my undergraduate dissertation on the topic although it's got nothing to do with what I research now but this still holds a very very strong place in my heart because not only does it have a lot of history behind it, it's also just such a fun readable story. The edition I have here is the translation by Ronald McHale published by Oxford World Classics. As you've seen I have quite a few of their editions. They are one of my favourite go-tos if I don't know which translation I want in particular. And it is in essence the story of the shepherdess and goat herd Chloe and Daphnis who have reached a stage in their life where they've started to feel sexual attraction for the other and don't know what to do about it. It's comical, it's entertaining and it's just, like I said, so readable. One that I think just demonstrates how old the desire for entertaining literature is and also makes you feel a little bit closer to the ancient Greeks themselves. We then have my final recommendation which is the Library of Greek Mythology by Apollodorus and this is my go-to recommendation for anybody who wants an overview of Greek mythology from the original literature. Of course you can read modern volumes. I myself have written a children's non-fiction title all about Greek mythology which would introduce you to the myths. In fact, shall I show you? Shall I plug? This is my time to self-insert plug right here. I have written, like I said, a volume of Greek myths aimed at children called Greek Myths Meet the Heroes, Gods and Monsters of Ancient Greece written by myself and illustrated by the incredible Katie Ponder. And of course there are volumes like this aimed at adults but if you want to return to the ancient literature, if you want to read familiar and unfamiliar myths all in one place, then read Apollodorus because this is basically a collection of short stories, some of which are literally a paragraph long, others of which last for many pages, and they also demonstrate the way in which ancient Greek mythology is intertwined because often one myth leads into another chronologically and characters you know from one myth actually meet characters you know from another myth in another. This edition even has a glossary at the back so you can look up any names you want to learn more about or have just read online and don't know who they are to read their story. It is the closest thing in ancient Greek literature you will find to a full collection of their myths in one place. It's not that, because that doesn't exist, but it's the closest thing you'll find. So that is my introduction to ancient Greek literature with my recommendations of where to start. I am more than happy to answer any further questions you have in the comments down below about translations, about editions, about 
going deeper into these genres or looking at other genres I haven't mentioned in this video, just feel free to leave your thoughts and questions down below like I mentioned and I will get to answering them. But in the meantime, thank you for watching, happy reading and I'll see you all again in the next one. Bye everyone!